Hello, everyone. I'm Bill Raggio. I'm a senior fellow at Foundation for Defense of Democracies and editor of FDD's Long War Journal. This is Generation Jihad, the podcast that covers all things in what used to be known as the global war on terror, but we now call the Long War. Well, it's a Freaky Friday, so of course, my co-host, my friend and colleague, Benham Ben Talablu, a senior fellow at FDD who focuses on Iranian security and political issues and so much more in the region. Benham, uh, welcome. It's great to talk to you on a, on a Friday. Thanks, Bill. Always a pleasure to be with you. Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to Freaky Fridays. Yep. Yeah, we got a lot to talk about today. A lot of things going on, Benham. Some things I got to tell you. Um, the first item we're going to discuss, of course, is the Biden administration um, halting weapons shipments, some weapons shipments to Israel. Um, from what I can gather, um, these include guided munitions as well as artillery shells. These are two items that the the Israeli military would use in an assault on um, the city of Rafa in southern Gaza. Now, look, the Israelis probably have enough in their stockpiles to to conduct the operation and they are beginning it, it does appear they're at the beginnings of an operation in rafa but um yeah this is quite concerning i never thought honestly that i would live to see the day where the u.s would abandon its ally like this to treat the uh, it's one of its closest allies um like this but then again we witnessed what happened in afghanistan just about three years ago so it doesn't it surprise me that it's happening under this administration. So, Ben, my first question to you. So what does the administration's actions um, say to the enemies of both Israel and the United States? And what do these actions also say about their friends? Sorry, it's a two-point part question there, but uh, I figured you could you can handle it. No, no, it's a good question. I mean, kind of, kind of zooming out philosophically for a second – if you remember even the debates about the supplemental at the end, you know, regardless of whether you think it was worth it or not, or too much or too little or too politicized, the contrast really is right now with the U.S. and its friends and its partners and even the beleaguered democracies or even just beleaguered friends that we may have. Um, our adversaries and their adversaries, the adversaries of our friends, are doing a much better job about compartmentalizing the conflicts they have with one another. Structurally, politically, historically, Iran and Russia have great enmity, great mistrust with one another. But they've been able to put a lot of that aside to coordinate because they have a least common denominator that's growing. Israel and America have a huge least common denominator, a huge one, not just moral and political, but strategic when it comes to the defeat of Hamas. In this case, I think it's the politics of the moment. And beyond the politics of the moment, it's the image recreated by the politics of the moment, because that's precisely what Iran and its acts of resistance is living for, putting distance between partners and allies, external and internal. And so the image it sends, the message it sends is that the U.S. is indeed holding back, that the Iranians can indeed, and have indeed, as you saw potentially even with the missile attack, can count on the U.S. trying to, for lack of better word, after this many months, yank the leash or pull the chain uh, or prevent or slow the defeat of one of the elements of this Iran-backed acts of resistance. Because lest we forget, you know, what the defeat of Hamas would entail, whether that was, you know, defeating them 100% in Gaza City or Khan Yunus or Rafa or wherever they may be. Hypothetically, there is a group like Hamas that exists in the acts of resistance outside of uh, the Gaza Strip, right? Just think like that for a second. What that would vindicate and validate is that you can use military force against an element of the axis of resistance to take a piece of this axis off the chessboard and have things not lead to World War III. Because Iran has trying to be moving these pieces around to prevent a limited war option against it and against its axis. And that's why when the U.S. is indeed holding back certain kinds of munitions, slowing the pace of the Israeli operation, what that does is invalidate the thesis of limited military force against a, a member of the axis of resistance. And it is precisely in that moment of an invalidated application of military force that Iran and its proxies and its partners thrive. They thrive from the political space between America and Israel being broadened, being deepened, being widened. And then they also thrive from 
the adversary, the U.S., Israel, whoever, being forced to settle for a non-military option, forced to settle for a suboptimal option, and have to climb down from the stated war aims of last October. So in this sense, one may understand, given the politics of the moment, how the Biden administration is doing it. And you see right now the, the war on American campuses, uh, whether one agrees or disagrees. But strategically, you know, this stuff is an own goal. And it's an own goal that the Iranians are telling you about in their own media of how uh, large and strategic those proportions of that own goal really are. Yeah, Ben, we, that's a great point. And the we've seen Hezbollah, um, Hassan Nasrallah has come out and stated that, you know, he, he's been telling us about our own goals as well. He loves the, the divisions between the U.S. and Israel, loves the con- campus protests. It's a it's it's a real mistake. And you had mentioned, you know, the getting suboptimal solutions to these problems. And that's, you know, it seems we're destined for that. And those suboptimal solutions will be will mean the continuation of Hamas at this rate. The administration seems hell bent at this point on allowing Hamas to survive this fight. And I think that this is, a, you know, I think it's even less than suboptimal. I'm not sure how Israel emerges from this with Hamas and if if Hamas is intact and is ruling Gaza the day after Israel withdraws from the Gaza Strip. I I I don't know how Israel weathers that storm. It's just that will be blood in the water for the axis of resistance. And politically socially inside Israel, um if you have this imagery of the IDF retreating and the rocket fire resuming, however successfully intercepted that rocket fire may be, uh, it's a worse version of what we had in 2011, which was there was an uptick in the rocket and particularly then the IRAM attacks, 2010, 2011, as it looked like the U.S. was going to be withdrawing from Iraq. And that was part of the imagery that the militias wanted to cement, which is that we're driving you out, that you did not accomplish your military goals. Even though the U.S. military presence in Iraq was totally not against the Shia militias, it was against uh, the Saddam Hussein government in Baghdad, the throw- overthrowing of the Ba'athist regime, and the creation of a new political order uh, at that time. Uh, but here, the imagery of more of the same members that the Israelis tried to destroy members of a terrorist group known as Hamas that engage in October 7. Oh, and by the way, no clarity as to what the political and strategic goals are vis-a-vis the other Iranian proxy in the Gaza Strip, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, their capabilities, their personnel, uh, and what's left of their networks, um, firing at you from the same space, Gaza, that you believed so long it was going to be occupied or led by an Iran-backed proxy would pose a near existential threat to your survival, that's not going to go down well politically and socially inside Israel. And I think um, decision makers in Israel know that, but what's worse, you know, decision makers in Tehran and among uh, the Hamas militants, they know that too. If the Israelis aren't able to finish the job in Hamas, what is that? I'm, I'm sorry, in, Hamas, in, in Gaza, um, what does that say about their ability to finish the job? with Hezbollah uh, in the North too. I mean, these are serious problems and Israel cannot afford to show weakness here. And yet the United States, the Biden administration is trying to force them to show weakness. It's a complete misunderstanding of the, um, the political situation within Israel, as well as as Israel's um, situation vis-a-vis its, its enemies in the region. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly not a good look for trying to reestablish. I think deterrence in some weird way is gone. It's, it's, it's really just a matter of how much can both Hezbollah and Israel tolerate of the Northern Front changing? Because you can't go from losing against Hamas or failing to achieve your political objectives against Hamas to trying to impose those on Hezbollah, where both the political, military, and economic, as well as humanitarian costs are going to be significantly greater. Um, so that means that the political will or the military capability behind any kind of initial uptick in military action between the IDF and Hezbollah, no matter how much retaliatory or no matter how much legal and justified, is not going to be in the Israeli column. And that will give exactly the forces of darkness, whether it's Nasrallah, Assad, Khamenei, whoever, more incentive to do what they do best, which is this kind of waiting game. Yeah, absolutely. So, Ben, um, uh, how about our friends? If you're Ukraine, if you're Taiwan, 
if you're in South Korea, you know, three areas of potential con- of conflict. Well, one is an active conflict and two other areas of potential near conflict. Uh, should you be very concerned if you're watching this? If you've seen what happened in Afghanistan, the U.S. abandoned an ally. If you're watching what's happening in, in, in Israel uh, today with the U.S. restraining an ally. Um, should, I mean, you absolutely should. I mean, look at look at uh, I mean, in some weird, unique way, we're encouraging the further militarization uh, of Japan, given the China challenge. Uh, we're relying a lot more on other partners in the Asia Pacific, like Australia and India. And I think that trend line is set to grow because of the costs of containing China. But then you pivot back into, into our region, the region we're looking at now, the Middle East. Just look at the behavior of other U.S. partners and allies, how much they've been hedging, sometimes Israel included. I'm talking about Saudi Arabia. I'm talking about the United Arab Emirates. I'm talking about Oman. Uh, not least to talk about Qatar and how one may want to frame them, given the fact that they have this U.S. airbase there. But again, they're footsie with the Taliban and Hamas and their gross presence of terror financiers on their own territory. So all of this said is that if you're a U.S. partner, uh, the trend lines tell you you should be hedging. The politics and the dysfunction of Washington tells you you should be hedging. The problem is, even when you agree with one element of U.S. policy, it's highly likely now that there'll be a flip-flop in it. I mean, the Republicans are tough on Iran, the Democrats are tough on Russia. Now there seems to be some kind of weird middle bipartisan consensus on being hawkish on China. But the constituencies for the pressure that live in the front lines of the Middle East, East Asia, and Central and Eastern Europe, uh, they live on the front lines of those conflicts. So they can't count on two years on, four years off, four years on, two years off of a changing policy, which is precisely why I think we're seeing some very unhelpful behavior from our allies. It's moving from some kind of hedging to some kind of accommodation. Our allies and our friends even, they don't need a legitimate legal political treaty with them for this to be true. Our friends uh, on the front lines of, of many of these parts of the world have not changed their views of these rising and revisionist powers. They harbor great distrust towards them. And here I'm particularly talking about the Middle East. But they're straddling this world because they're, they really do feel like they're left between a rock and a hard place. And particularly if we're talking about a country like Saudi Arabia, much of whose security strategy during the Cold War was essentially pay to play in energy for security with the West. And if there are new threats arising from Iran and the patrons of Iran, which are coming from the East, why not do the same there? And I think that that kind of brass tax calculation is going to be putting the U.S. politically and diplomatically in the short to medium term. I'm talking the next 10 to 20 years uh, in these three different uh, geographies, Eastern and Central Europe, Middle East, and the Asia Pacific, uh, in a really tough spot. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Ben. I mean, this is the, our allies, our friends are increasingly questioning whether the United States is a reliable ally. And based on what I've seen and what this administration has demonstrated, they're showing that that we're not that the United States isn't. That is extremely dangerous, particularly for a country that wants to present itself as a global power. The um during his uh, statement on uh, his interview on Wednesday, President Biden claimed that he said the following, I'll put it in quotes here, quote, we will help you, that would be the Israelis, get Yahya Sinwar, end quote. He's referring to the Hamas leader who's in hiding in Gaza. This is the architect of October 7th. Given everything that the United States has done, is this a, do you view this as being a statement that the israelis can take seriously i mean did, did are we after let, i'm going to go down a list of things that the, the u.s has done since october 7th um we've the united states has the biden administration has delayed and attempted to actually spike the um operation in rafa um they've threatened sanctions against israeli military units and actually applied sanctions on a couple of individual israeli settlers they this isn't directly administration, but senior Democratic leaders called for the uh, for the ouster of Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, and by the way, the you know this is congressmen and senators, but the the administration really did not say anything when these statements were made. Failed to veto a, a UN a United Nations Security Council resolution, and then other constant admonishments for the Israelis to you know about using um, Hamas casualties in Gaza. We could go on and on. Are, after all of these things, are we expected to believe that the Biden administration is going to somehow be able to help 
us get help the Israelis get Yehia Sinwar? Does this make any sense? I mean, there's a question of everything you mentioned, which is the vacillation, the flip flopping, the hedging from now the patron uh, rather than partner from from someone like the U.S. on this scale since October seven, uh, and the changing political tolerance and and really even footprint uh, of us uh, in this conflict, but. Then there's the capability issue. If this really was an option, I wonder why the Biden administration didn't float it earlier. If they really didn't want like a massive land war in Gaza and were not convinced about the prospects to build political order in Gaza, even after Israel would be uh, allegedly militarily successful there, why wasn't this targeted idea of assassinations, which, by the way, we've seen the Israelis be able to do quite well across multiple geographies of the Middle East and elsewhere, um, to adjudicate their own political conflicts with people who are trying to kill them and have painted a target on their back and on the target of many Jews around the world. Why haven't they been able to offer this up? And why was this not taken? Why was this not even floated publicly? Um, and what do they think it'll achieve now, almost seven months into the conflict? Will it really pump the brakes? Will it really gut Hamas? I mean, this is kind of at this point in time, that this offer, this statement, after the botch stuff with the peer, even if you want to add that uh, sure. to, to the list, uh, how about of, silence on protests? Oh yeah, all, right? all of this stuff. Like if you, if you want to add all this, this becomes a cocktail, an intoxicating cocktail um, that shows the U.S. is adrift. That even if we wanted to to pressure a partner, we don't know how. And this half in, half out business that we've you know mishandled with our adversaries when it comes to signal and resolve, we don't know how to signal credibility uh, to some of our partners. And you're seeing that with this kind of belatedly floated offer to help go after one of these Hamas masterminds. Um, and the vacuum, some, some things rarely come out of a vacuum. This is coming out of a vacuum. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I couldn't agree more, Ben. And, you know, I look at this, there's still American hostages being held by Hamas and its allies. The Biden administration hasn't been able to, to secure the release of those hostages. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Great point. I, are we expected to believe that somehow they're going to go be able to get help the Israelis get Yahya Sinwar? This is just fantastical stuff. This is I, I just I find it difficult to take anything the administration says about Israel and its war with Hamas and, and in Gaza um, and its war against the access of resistance seriously at this point. Um, and that really leads to my next question and this is a loaded question i will admit it after that laundry list i read off to you benham is it isn't it difficult is it difficult to conclude that the biden administration still supports israel at this point in time the macro trend lines the supplemental the fact that they retained qme the the deep personal connection the president has yes the u.s supports israel yes president biden supports israel but the aggregate behaviors lead to the situation where the U.S. and Israel are not at all divorced from one another. There's still great mill-to-mill -mill political intelligence, economic enmeshment, cooperation. But the U.S. has not been helpful in its own quest to support Israel. And in the creation of that distance and in the creation of that gap, um, which is coming at a, at a very kind of precarious time in the Middle East that is encouraging more behavior and, and more instability, more kind of hedging behavior from our allies and more instability from our adversaries. Um, this is, this is, this just shows, this is an example to me of something that's poorly planned, poorly managed, um, and doesn't redound to the national interest or uh, of the Biden administration or, or the U S I should say for that matter. So here in some, the U.S. has been doing things to undermine its ability to stand with Israel and its ability to be a credible partner for Israel, all the meanwhile absorbing the cost of trying to be a good political partner for Israel. And in, and in this sense, it really is stuck. And this is a predicament of its own making because it's tried to square peg round hole the strategic imperatives coming out of the region with the politics of the moment and the hedging that comes with this changing zeitgeist. So suffice to say, if their own, if you take the administration and particularly the president at his own words of being pro-Israel and standing with them, then they have done things to hurt their own goals. I think that's, and I'm saying this in a very charitable manner. I think it would be very easy to take it one or two or three steps and say, no, they're they're hedging away or they're, it's not all that it appears. But I'm trying to give the, present the most charitable case given the trend lines of the U.S.-Israel relationship. This stuff now, it's not akin to a full backstabbing, but 
it is unhelpful. And it's a dirty airing of the dirty laundry in public that we talked about doing all those things that lead to, again, more hedging by our allies elsewhere and more instability by our adversaries because they can press upon these fault lines, particularly on fault lines that used to not exist in a relationship so strong as the U.S.-Israel relationship. Yeah, I, I think there's two things you have to look at here. And I, I think the administration is deathly fearful of the war widening. So what it's trying to do, that's why it's trying to put the brakes on Israel. I think it's misreading this and that its actions actually increase the likelihood of a wider war. But, you know, that's my opinion. And I also think that domestic politics is playing a role in here. Uh, I have a good friend who um, always says that, you know, President Biden has a two-state solution, and that's uh, Michigan and uh, Minnesota. And the joke is, you know, he's appealing to the Muslim populations there. Again, I think that's misguided because what he's doing, you know, they're not happy with him regardless. He's not pleasing anyone here. But, you know, so if all that being considered, as you said, Benham, his actions give the appearance of a break in the relationship of not being a full, you know, a full supporter of Israel. And I don't think the average person who's not looking at, you know, looking a a layer too deeper at this. Could be blamed if um, they thought that the Biden administration has abandoned Israel at, at, at its moment of need. So, you know, I don't personally think that he's, you know, abandoned Israel, but I think his actions certainly would allow people to believe. That. I'm away with that. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, and that's dangerous. And, you know, I think he has to be considering his uh, his Jewish voters as well. But you know, we don't do domestic politics here, but that's, again, I think there's a lot of miscalculations going on here. And I'm going to, you know, one other thing too, you know, Benham, you know, if you even question U.S., what is the strategy for Ukraine? What are we doing with the money that we're sending Ms. Ukraine? What happened to that offensive that happened last year and the billion dollars the U.S. sent? If you even question that, you are branded as pro-Putin. And you know, I've heard the same criticism of myself, right? Because these are questions that I have. Wanting to Russia to be defeated, but knowing what we're doing isn't working does not make me pro-Putin. It makes me someone who analyzes what's happening. And yet, you know, the Biden administration could do all of the things we discussed on that list and what we added to. And yet somehow we're supposed to believe based on their logic, right? That they're pro-Israel. I just find that ironic, just something I wanted to bring up. Um, do you have any comment on that or no? I mean, I did on, on the Ukraine one, just very briefly. There's, there's, aren't the Russians also starting a, a, a new offensive now trying to go into Kharkiv? It's unclear if they're trying to secure a buffer zone or if they are actually trying to take the city. They may be trying to tie up Ukrainian troops, um, for their operations, you know, tie up reserves because Ukrainians are very limited. Um, they're having problems with with numbers in the south where the Russians are advancing. So we don't know. Well, it's it's in the opening, right? But like these are the problems that people like me who were, you know, talking and watching these issues and asking questions going, you could see some of these problems happening. And so, you know, 160 billion plus, that's just in the last two years of American money going. I'd like to see that go to a, a winning strategy or a strategy that doesn't cause Ukraine to lose more territory. Right. Yeah. We encouraged an offensive last year. Sorry, I don't mean to go into your uh-huh. whole Ukraine rant here. We encouraged and built the Ukrainians an army to basically cut the land bridge. And it failed. They didn't penetrate eight miles when they needed to go about 60. Um, that's that's a failure. And you, we should be able to question that without being called pro-Putin. And if you're going to call me pro-Putin, I just want to say, you know, you might want to look and, you know, there might be other terms you could use for the Biden administration, given that given what it has done, what it, its actions and its words towards the Israelis. No, I feel you there. Yeah, that's just a you know little little personal annoyance in all this, and in the you know it gets to that you know that's the Twitter world, or I guess it's X now, and the social media aspect of this. Of if you just don't conform, you are going to be. Um, you know, castigated. And I find that to be uh, just a tad annoying, but let's, let's change the uh, tact here. And Iran made an announcement in the last couple of days that it's going to change its nuclear doctrine. Explain this to Ben. And what are the implications of this? 
Well, this is not the first time we've heard this statement, uh, and it's certainly not going to be the last time. You, there's been a steady stream of commentary, and I think we've even briefly covered part of this evolving commentary before. A lot of it is coming in the aftermath of these three exchanges, April 1st, the Israelis going after a major IRGC officials and what was alleged to be an Iranian consulate, but not really, an annex to a diplomatic facility uh, in Damascus, then April 13, 14, the historic and unprecedented Iranian drone, cruise missile, and ballistic missile barrage against Israel. Then, of course, the April 19 uh, Israeli limited but not uh, overt kinetic retaliation against uh, SAMs and air defenses inside Iranian territory. And now there's kind of this been this standing down. But the Iranians also understand that the more their conventional deterrence is eroded. So ironically, this is a product of success, not failure for America, for Israel, for anyone else. The more successful... Um, air and missile defense in an integrated fashion is between the Arabs, between the Israelis, between the Americans, between other Western forces. Um, the more devalued Iran's long-range strike capabilities is, the more the regime may feel the need to press into this area. And that's one. We don't want to fully put the blame on us because after all, the WMD program, the nuclear program, the missile program, and other programs, those are all programs the regime has invested significant money in over time. You don't just invest this money and pay this cost just to, uh, you know, uh, trade it away at a, at a moment's notice. Uh, you do it because you want the ultimate dividend, the deterrent dividend. But the regime in Iran has actually, in my view, been benefiting for free from the deterrent dividend of its significant nuclear program without fully weaponizing it by having this kind of conventional long-range strike capability as well. So when you devalue one leg of that important architecture, you have to overvalue the other one. And this is precisely what the regime is trying to do. Talk about overvaluing the other leg, meaning growing the nuclear capacity uh, here to basically dangle as nuclear blackmail or as a nuclear sword of Damocles over the head of its adversaries and to prevent them from having more wins in pushing back on Iran politically, economically, or militarily. And comments about changing Iran's nuclear doctrine, comments about changing the purpose of Iran's nuclear infrastructure, comments about growing Iran's nuclear infrastructure, comments about having all they need to produce a bomb, comments about having all they need to produce a bomb at a moment's notice, all of these kinds of comments that we've been seeing in spades in 2024 alone, but actually have their origins in a larger political hedging strategy that is married on top of a policy of latency uh, to grow their program incrementally, gets you to this very precarious point. And at this point in time, something like snapback, which many people in Europe and America and elsewhere see as escalatory because Iran may go to 90% in a, response, in a bid to offset snapback, is actually not escalatory. It is actually an attempt to keep parity with this very fast evolving Iranian domestic nuclear challenge. Uh, and if I can just say, we're likely again to hear more about this, not less, both based on the will of Iranian leaders, the capability of this program, the speed at which this program can grow, and also the political and strategic utility of dangling this as other the other side. Again, be that America, Israel, whomever, seems to get more wins against this other arsenal of Iranian threats, which are drones, missiles, terrorism, asymmetric maritime threats, what have you. So ironically, these can come to you as problems in international relations as products of success, not failure. Meaning you might be so good at pushing back and eroding and denuding the conventional capabilities of this adversary that you may underwrite their expansion in this area. You know, I never wrote this article, but I did intend to write it about, you know, the ironies of success in the Middle East. You know, we were so successful in the 1980s and 90s about locking down conventional arms markets to Iran and freezing Iran out of conventional arms markets that this became a robust domestic military industrial base that now has an advanced asymmetric military capability. And as it's emerging and trying to move into these new armed markets, both as salesman and purchaser, it is becoming a hybrid warfighter. That's a, you know, your last point, you know, that's something that, um, you know, the adaptability of, of countries like Iran, you know, when you leverage sanctions, when you cut off, you know, things that they need, that if, if they're competent, they'll develop it domestically. And that is something that we tend to underestimate. We tend to think here in the West, this is my opinion. Anyway, I look at, I'll, I'm going to bring back Ukraine, right? Look at the outset. We'll sanction Russia. That'll break their oligarchs and, you know, will be bankrupt, you know, the, the and the war will end. And here we are two plus years later and the Russians are advancing. Their economy is actually, you know, growing. 
sometimes the things we do have unintended consequences and, and that's really worries me. But I guess my next question for you, Benham is Iran. First of all, do you think that Iran has the capability to develop a nuclear weapon quickly as they, as they claim to do? Perhaps not as quickly as they claim, but it's an open question. It can be anywhere. So to, to, you know, get one bomb's worth of fissile material, you're basically in less than two weeks. To get a handful using the declared stockpile they have, so to basically get to weapons-grade purity for one of the three legs, um, that would be, uh, you know, a couple of months. From there, you have the delivery vehicle, which, you know, all of their medium-range ballistic missiles are capable of carrying a nuclear payload. There are questions as to the known bomb size, basically how miniature can Iran go to fit into some of its newer uh, biconic and triconic warheads. Uh, some of those have a smaller cross-section. Almost all of those are separating. Um, but beyond that, there's a question of how – there's an unknown intelligence question as to how much kind of heat shielding and ablative technology – uh, they have for their reentry vehicles of some of their warheads. So that's that's an intelligence question. And then weaponization. We know that you know this regime resurrected the late Shah's nuclear program in the 1980s, even though Khomeini entered power in 1979-1980, basically mocking nuclear technology and Iran's bid for nuclear reactors as foolish and not understanding the oil power that Iran had and the Shah's Western decadence and all this stuff. But the deterrence lessons of having a nuke came home really sharply during the Iran-Iraq War, and that was when they resurrected this program. And basically from 1982, 1983, all the way until 2002, when they had, uh, 2002, 2003, when they had their nuclear program and enrichment uh, capacities discovered, uh, they had a quest for a bomb, and they were looking to dash to a bomb as safely as possible. Now they're not looking to dash, they're looking to build this capability, but they're having to do it in public. So they're inching along, they're building kind of dual-use rationales as they go along the way. The program does not make sense politically or economically unless you look at this program as the precursor to develop a nuclear weapon. I would stress for policymakers, however, that the irony here is not that Khamenei uh, will have his legacy be nuclearizing Iran or bequeathing a nuke to his successor. His legacy is that he was not supposed to be supreme leader and that he is now the Middle East's longest running autocrat. And he was able to keep his country's anti-American and anti-Israeli disposition afloat and ascendant in the foreign policy without ever having to pay a real price for it. And he has been able to fight wars without really even inviting the kind of kinetic retribution that would come to any other kind of country. And part of that is this deterrent architecture they have of missiles and terrorism and maritime capabilities, plus, of course, this advanced uh, nuclear program. Yeah, I would argue part of his legacy, too, is, is um, you know, the, the militias have, a, you know, his axis of resistance that he's oh, absolutely. Built. Yeah, that's a, it, it's a, it. It really and if he, you know, he does cap it off with a nuclear bomb. Um, I, I do think that would be a, you know, uh, here's the in intellectual question to ask though, right? The bomb is, you know, it's a non-zero chance that they would use it because they have talked about Israel being the one bomb state. Uh, they have used chemical weapons before there's U S intelligence evidence that is declassified from the Iran Iraq war. It was retaliatory. It was much more limited than what Saddam had done. That's an important caveat that it was retaliatory, but <clears throat> The question is, beyond this kind of psychological element of regime survival and deterrence, what does a nuke actually give them? Because the U.S., even without a nuke, has not attacked a weaker Iran, and it's That's waited an and waited point, and waited yeah. so much so that the costs of an attack have gone up so significantly. Hypothetically, and I don't support this, but the John Boltons of the world who like 2002, 3, 4, 5 came out and they said you, that you can use a military option against Iran's nuclear program, that option is not really there today in the way it existed between 2002 and 2005 because of what you said, the prevalence of the militias and because of the stuff that I work on, the evolution of the missile and the drone program. So in this world, Khamenei has been able to create nuclear deterrence without the political cost of weaponizing his nuclear program all the way by having such an advanced long-range strike capability, such an advanced terror network, and such an advanced, quote-unquote, civil nuclear program that could be repurposed at a moment's notice. So by having all the pieces of the puzzle in place, we may be missing the forest through the trees, which is this guy has achieved a new version of deterrence, and that a lot of our language about deterrence is inadequate to deal with this. It doesn't mean he's not going to go all the way, 
but it is to understand why he feels safe today with what he has. Yeah, that's that is a really sorry to mean to, to interrupt you. That, I, but it just struck me. He's built deterrence without a nuclear weapon. That's in the background. But and this is gets back to why is Biden putting so much pressure on Israel? The fear of a wider war breaking out. It's not because Israel or I'm sorry, Iran is going to launch armies across the border throughout the Middle East. It's because it has armies in Iraq and Syria and in Gaza and the West Bank and in Lebanon and in Yemen. It has these militias forward deployed. And this is, you know, it's just it's made multiple administrations. Um, it's just handcuffed them. And uh, I think you're right, Benham. I think that they've developed a form of deterrence, a non-nuclear deterrence that has been quite effective for the Iranian regime. And I mean, again, the fact that there is no model for this of the hybrid conventional and technical on the nuclear side is dangerous because it means we are in uncharted territory. It means that these kind of comments matter a great deal. And I know with respect, some who focus on Iran or some who focus on the nuclear program in our own office at FDE don't necessarily see it this way. But, you know, once I saw this, I could not unsee it. The, the, the way they've been able to put A plus B plus C, and you don't have to take it from me, take it from Israel, right? When Iran struck Israel, they publicized it. When Israel, for the first time ever, used overt military force from its own territory, it did not enter Iranian airspace, but it fired into Iranian airspace, right? Based on what we know about the strike, probably air-launched ballistic missile. It did not publicize the strike. Now, that was due to a whole host of factors about, you know, you know, tamping down Iran's propensity to escalate, to have to respond, to let Iran look like he got the last round, a lot of political pressure from the Biden administration, all of these things. But the fact that Israel could not even claim it publicly it means that Iranian deterrence has worked, it means that the fear of what may come after is already in the zeitgeist. It's already forced to be contended with in Israeli national security planning and American national security planning. And the, fee, the the challenge with this is the longer the time horizon, the more you delay and the more you think you're rearming and doing all the things to cross your T's and dot your I's, the more they're evolving. So the irony here has been that if we didn't like the costs of what it would have been like to do some kind of limited military operation a la the John Bolton years, a la 2002 to 5, those costs have grown significantly today. And that timeline is what Khamenei is counting on deterring you. He wants you to do the responsible thing, push away from the table, delay, build up your own stuff. But at the same time as you build, he builds. Yeah, it's uh, it's, uh, it's fascinating, Ben. We're going to have to explore this more in the future. Um, May 9th, that would be yesterday, um, the Houthis launched two more missiles against uh, shipping in the Red Sea. The Houthi problem is not going away, Benham. What um, is this just yet another uh, version or another, uh, or sh should I say, the Iranians have won this round when it's come when it comes to the Houthis because the West is not willing to meaningfully strike at Houthi military or political leadership, and in my estimation, go after Houthi military infrastructure, more than just missiles on launch or rockets on launch pads or drones, but actually go after some of the things that mean something that keep them in power. Um, do you see any prospect of the West regaining control of the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden? I, I think the West is in control, as it were, but it's a contested control. You know, it's not the mastery, if you will, of the past. And in this sense, this is this is the world that the axis of resistance is content with living in, which is incrementally biting away from the bottom, the grassroots, the bottom up overture, pressure, containing, contextualizing, limiting, eroding of a lot of the norms that have come with this kind of Western security presence, this liberal international order. And I think here, the, the Houthis are graduating the world into living with the cost of this kind of asymmetric maritime attack, which we only used to think about in the Persian Gulf and Strait of Hormuz. And now we're dealing with, out of, as an outgrowth of that area, into the Red Sea and the Bab el-Mandeb and the Gulf of Aden. 
Um, so I think we're we're in store for a lot more of these sporadic kind of missile attacks. And given that the Houthis still control large swaths of territory in Yemen and, and are actually digging underground now, they're, again, the adversary is not static. Just like as Iran was not static to the sanctions, the Houthis are not static to the aerial campaign against some of their capabilities. They are digging under. They are tunneling. I would not be surprised if the U.S. does have to do a larger military operation there, that it would be confronted with a robust tunnel architecture, not a la Hamas, but something kind of close, or have to contend with a world of significant humanitarian casualties, given what the world is watching about the way that Hamas is so effectively able to use human shields. And the inability and the hesitancy and the delaying of going after more robust, more important Houthi long-range strike assets, as well as the Houthi leadership, means that those costs, just like the costs of going against Iran's nuclear program, will grow, not lessen, over time. So this is one of those trend lines you're seeing that it's kind of like watching a car accident. Like, you know it's coming, but you can't look away. Yeah, you know, Benham, if the new norm is, you know, container ships and fuel tankers having to bypass the Red Sea um, and the Suez Canal and going around uh, Africa uh, with a, a very expensive deployment by the United States, I mean, that's another thing that's not understood. The cost in the U.S. cost in missiles that are used to shoot these down to keep these ships on station, the maintenance required, you know, how that's how these deployments are messing up uh, deployment schedules and maintenance for the ships, which rises up costs. There's, there's just a lot of costs involved here. And I have part of me wonders is this is part of the strategy of the Iranians, you know, force us to deploy. But the other thing I look at here too, is boy, if I'm the Chinese and I'm watching the U S be willing to eat it in the red sea, in the Gulf of Aden by allowing the Houthis to persist, the more I'd be thinking that, you know, maybe the time to invade Taiwan is, you know, coming closer. That's that's the other risk of not being forceful here. Um, but the administration, it's looking at the, the you know, I think the administration's calculation here is just that it is with restraining Israel is that it doesn't want to spark a wider war. But sometimes, you know, I think this is a big miscalculation, a big mistake by the administration. No, oh, I agree. Maybe so let's hardly. Uh, yeah, it, I, it, this is this is just so difficult to watch. Um, you know, you could see the problems, you could see how enemies per- perceive this, and yet, you know, inaction and you know, it just really it, it encourages our enemies. So last item in Benham, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network issued a, this two days ago, issued on May eighth, issued an advisory on. Iran-backed terrorist organizations. Tell us about this. What are the implications? Sure. This is a, an important update for people who live a bit more in the sanctions world than in some of this hard power world that we're dealing with constantly of guns and bombs. But it's important because there is a robust financial sanctions architecture, not just on the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is the world's foremost state-sponsored terrorist, but this broader acts of resistance architecture. So in this many page PDF, here's a US government entity talking about the need to engage in due diligence, talking about the need to know your customer and know your customer's customer in trades in the region because of Iran's ability to support this broad array, this axis of resistance through lots of unconventional and traditional illicit finance means. So consider this an important warning, alarm bell that the US is putting out about Iran's ability to sustain this axis of resistance, despite it being under pressure from various parts, sanctions, political, military, economy, domestic, uh, than ever before. So uh, this is a call for attention. This is a call for due diligence, uh, but also a call for education. You know, not everyone knows about the depths of how Iran has been able to fundraise, for example, for the Houthis. If you remember back in, I think, 2018, Treasury Department designated a Iranian uh, illicit finance ring that was helping print Yemeni banknotes using German technology, German printing technology. So all of this stuff is connected. And all of this stuff, the asymmetric capabilities, the terrorism, the illicit finance, these are weapons of the weak and these are our adversaries' plan B in response to our plan A. Once their plan A is hit, they adapt to our pressure to keep the things that they value, their ideologies, their strategies, their networks alive. 
So I would highly recommend folks take a look at it. It's got a section on Hamas and the Houthis and uh, some of the other Shia militia groups in there. Uh, but it's an important wake up call, uh, both for industry and policymakers. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to quote from the last paragraph of the press release from it. And it says, quote, Iran seeks, among other goals, to project power by exporting terrorism throughout the Middle East and beyond by financing a range of regional and armed groups, some of which are U.S. designated foreign terrorist organizations or specially designated global terrorist organizations. These terrorist organizations include Lebanese Hezbollah, Hamas, the pa- the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Houthis, and several of Iran-aligned militia groups in Iraq and Syria, end quote. Of course, those militia groups would include the Sibal al-Haq and uh, Hezbollah brigades, and, uh, the whole uh, bevy of terror um, militias that are in Iraq and Syria. You know, what strikes me when I read these releases, right, of the clarity that exists in this press release, what I just read you there, and then yet we treat Iran with kid gloves. We oh, yeah. we lift um, restrictions on Iran, Iran's access to money that is being held. And I just, you know, just there just is no strategy when it comes really when it comes to dealing with Iran other than it's an ad it's, it's what it tells me. It's an ad hoc strategy. And it's and it's fight to live another day and delay and pay to play, you know, exactly. Kick the can down the road. That's what administrations learn over time. Benham, always a pleasure to speak with you on Friday, and I always look forward to it. Thank you. Absolutely. Likewise. Thanks for tuning in, everyone, and always a pleasure. Thanks to everyone for listening to today's episode of Generation Jihad. Just a reminder, you can listen to us on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Please subscribe to Generation Jihad and leave us a review, preferably a positive one, but only if we earned it. Thanks again, and we'll see you all again real soon.